Okay, canine evolution and domestication. Learning objectives. Describe the ancestors of today's domesticated dogs. Name, name several close relatives of today's domesticated dogs. List similarities and differences between dogs and wolves. And state two possible theories of how early dogs were domesticated. Where do they come from, these domestic dogs of ours? Molecular evidence shows that dogs descended from the gray wolf, and they evolved from the gray wolf about 300,000 years ago. If they all share a common ancestor, why do we have toy poodles and Great Danes that looked and act so differently from each other? It's pretty crazy, but years of selective breeding, breeding by humans has resulted in the artificial, quote, evolution of dogs into many different types. So the point that we'll keep coming back to as we talk about dogs and domesticated dogs and how they evolved is that there's nothing quite like the dog in regard to the genetic, or sorry, the physical variabilities. So the differences in the shape, behavior, size of the dogs, and yet they have genetic, <laughs> genetic similarities, genetic, um, they're, they're the same genetically almost. So it's pretty amazing, and we'll talk about that, that if we have dogs, they're all the same animal, they're all the same species. And technically, they're even a subspecies of the gray wolf, which is really crazy. So if you think about it, they're a subspecies of the gray wolf, and yet they might be a two-pound chihuahua, they might be a 170-pound uh, Dogo Argentino, that'd be giant for that dog. So all these crazy, crazy different variations in the dog, and essentially, really, when we look at it, they're the exact same animal. It's, it's really amazing because there's no other animal in the world that has such variation within the same species. So where do they come from? Selective breeding. That's what we were talking about. What is selective breeding? Well, that means when a litter of puppies is born and there's the smallest puppy who might also have a bob tail, let's say. So a smallest puppy has a bob tail. The owner wants a small dog with bob tails. That's the dog that they want to create over time. So what they're going to do is take that small dog with a bob tail find another small dog with a bob tail and they're going to continuously breed small dogs with bob tails into the mix until they eventually end up with the majority of the litter being born small with bob tails. <coughs> and that's selective breeding specifically. So that is not left up to circumstance, that's not let up, left up to its own, that is choosing the dog with the desirable traits that you're looking for and breeding it with another dog who has the same desirable traits that you're looking for. Now that being said, I said desirable traits. I should say desired traits because we all know that these traits, the majority of them are desired by people, but they're not actually desirable for the animal. And the perfect example of that is brachycephalic breeds who can't breathe, but the owner wants a squishy face dog. So look at this, this is amazing. So this is the gray wolf, and then it's subspecies. So subspecies, the bulldog, the chihuahua, the yorkie, the airedale, those are all the same species as the gray wolf, but it's just a subspecies, and then look at the huge variation. So was Darwin wrong? Darwin always, he, you know, he thought their diversity must reflect interbreeding with several types of wild dogs. Because if we go back again, looking at it, in order to get this variation of color, of coat, of size, of temperament, Darwin thought originally that the wolf would have had to breed with all sorts of different types of wild dogs to create that variability. But the DNA findings say differently. All modern, all modern dogs are descendants of wolves. So all modern dogs are created from wolves, as far as we know at this point in genetics. So it's proving Darwin wrong that, he, that the wolves didn't breed with a whole bunch of wild types of dogs. Instead, they bred with each other, and then over time with human interference, choosing those specific traits that we want to see portrayed, we performed selective breeding and really messed up the whole evolution thing. It's pretty amazing. So it is really amazing, or it's understandable that Darwin was wrong because dogs have remarkable physical diversity. Their genetic diversity is very limited, 
their genetic diversity is almost, um, they're, it's almost exactly the same for every dog, but their, their um, overall physical characteristics is extremely remarkable and variable. <clears throat> There's no other species like it on Earth. So like we said, uh, they stemmed from gray wolf is the current thought process. Now this always changes, right? Over time, theories about evolution, they definitely can be proven wrong. So this is currently our, our model that we're going to work from. The domestic dog is an extremely close relative of the gray wolf, differing from it by only 0.2% of DNA sequence. 0.2%, that's tiny. The coyote, in comparison, differs by 4% from the gray wolf. So if we look at those two animals, your first inclina inclination, I'm sure, is to think that the coyote and the gray wolf are much more closely linked because they look the same, they act very, very similar, not entirely similar, but very similar, similar size, similar behavioral patterns, and yet they differ by 4% <clears throat> genetically. And domestic dogs like the Yorkie, the Yorkshire Terrier, and the pug and the bulldog only differ by 0.2% of DNA sequence. <coughs> so dogs like wolves have very complex DNA. They have 78 chromosomes, each carrying thousands of genes, thousands of genes. By comparisons, humans have 46 chromosomes. Each gene is responsible for turning on or off a given trait and then showing that as the phenotype. The example is the eye color, the length of body, predatory drive, hip dysplasia, the brachycephalicness of their faces, the likelihood that their little eyeballs will pop out because they're too shallowly set in their head. All sorts of crazy things <clears throat> are controlled by turning on or turning off a single gene. Changing just one gene can have a huge, huge impact. So changing just one gene within that DNA sequence on that chromosome can have huge impact. So we can greatly affect traits from one dog breed to the next. The example, one gene controls the size of a dog. By changing this gene, we can produce mastiffs or chihuahuas. So there's a beautiful English mastiff and a tiny little chihuahua, and that is one gene that results in the size. Phenomenon seems to be relatively unique to dogs. So again, there's no species like dogs in regard to their genetic sim or sorry, their DNA similarities, but their physical variations. Generally less diversity has been created in other species in sorry, in other species by changing one gene. So let's look back a bit. Here's this little weasel-like guy again. So this is Myasis. He's a weasel-like carnivore. Around 50 million years ago, he was arboreal and den habitat. So arboreal is tree, and then den habitats is current to the dogs that we know now and current to wolves that we know now, where they like to live and sleep in a den and keep their house clean. So they tend to not defecate, not urinate inside their cave. They tend to remove food matter from their cage. And we think, maybe, that this is why dogs of current day have a good time, easy time being housebroken, is because they stemmed way back when from the myasis. So the myasis gave rise to most of today's predators. So dogs and cats and bears and raccoons, they all stemmed from myasis. Sanodictus was 35 million years ago. His feet and toes were suited for running, so instead of climbing trees, this guy could boot it across flat land. <clears throat> this is where we start to see the division for dogs and cats. So other predators branch off to other ancestors, whereas dogs and cats were directly related to Sanodictus. And then there's Tamarctus. Tamarctus is a really nice big dog, essentially. So he, he was five million years ago, dog-like in appearance. So to me, it looks like a German Shepherd, but it was the size of a bear. Who wouldn't want a dog the size of a bear? Now, it depends on the type of dog you have and if you have a great dog or a crummy dog, behaviorally. 
But realistically, who would not want a giant bear-like dog that you could just wrestle with and hug? So this was Tamarctus. He was essentially a giant bear-like dog. In Tamarctus, we start to see a development of strong social instincts, and those social instincts are still very much present in the dog and most of its close relatives. This gave rise, i.e. this was the founding ancestor, to all Canidae. So that's the family that includes the dog and its very close relatives. So looking down the line, we've got Myasis, Sinodictus, Tamarctus, and then all of a sudden we have all the Canidae species. Coyotes, wolves, wild dogs, dingoes, and of course, foxes, and then golden retrievers. So the dog family, Canidae, is a diverse group of 34 species, 34 discovered species, I should say, ranging in size and proportion, demonstrating morphological diversity. Looking at our domestic, domestic dog, we'll go through its class. So kingdom, Animalia, phylum, Chordata, Class, Mammalia, Order, Carnivora, Family, Canidae, Genus, Canis, Species, Lupus, and then, like I said earlier, the domestic dog is in fact a subspecies of the gray wolf. So it's a subspecies, Canis lupus familiaris. And these are the closest relatives in general. We'll go through some of the closest relatives that are all within the Canidae family, except for one we'll talk about. So this one is familiar in Australia, and it is a dingo. So the dingo is interesting because it once was a, not a somewhat domestic dog with the Aboriginal people in Australia, and over time the dingo was sent back to the wild. It sent itself back to the wild. So this is a dingo, Canis lupus dingo. Jackal is Canis aureus, it's common in Eurasia, and it's comparable to the coyote, smaller. And then these wily guys, we know these very well in North America, <coughs> these are the coyotes. So Canis latrans. <coughs> then there's the African hunting dog, Lycaon pictus, family Canidae, but not genus Canis. Important to note. Beautiful dogs. And then we have these little guys. These are mostly solitary. So we tend to see foxes. There's a lot of different types of foxes, at least 25 different types of foxes across the world. I think it might actually be more. They're the most solitary of the many Canidae species. So with that, we often see these guys in urban cores, but they're slightly, they're not as um, urban as the coyote. We'll see them outside the urban core, I should say. And what they'll often do, they'll have a den with their pups. They'll go out and hunt by themselves, bring back the food to their pups, and then carry on with their hunt. So they don't hunt in packs, unlike most of the Canada species. They are solitary. So this is the red fox, Volpes Volpes. The dole is the quan alpinus. And then we have the wolf, the canis lupus. And then we have today's dog. So today's dog, this little goofball, canis lupus familiaris. Canis familiaris before 1993, until it was relabeled. It is a direct descendant of the gray wolf, which is canis lupus. The behavior has changed through domestication. They differ in form from wolves. They're smaller and with shorter muzzles and smaller teeth. And then of course, so that's the general, general across the board that's overall typical. However, because of our selective breeding, in fact, some of the uh, um, Canis lupus familiaris some of them are in fact bigger than wolves, if we think about the English Mastiff that we saw in that previous picture. And of course, with that being said, some of them are going to have bigger teeth than wolves. So this is the general rule across the board, but humans have interfered so much in this selective, um, selective breeding and evolution, technically, that these rules definitely can be broken. So how the heck do they get from wolf to wolf? 
How and when did domestication happen? It's still debated. It's constantly being debated. So this is the information I can present to you today, and then in 15 years you might hear something completely different. So it was thought until very recently that dogs are wild until about 14,000 to 15,000 years ago, and that's when domestication began. DNA analysis published in 1997 suggests a date of about 130,000 years ago for the transformation of wolves into dogs. Again, it was believed that the gray wolf started to evolve around 300,000 years ago. So again, that evolution, this is why whenever people ask me in class, is it possible that cats could one day be like dogs? Is it possible that overall evolution, cats will start to look like dogs? Yes, anything is possible, especially with selective breeding. So anything technically is possible, but we're talking 300,000 years ago that the, the gray wolf started to evolve. So we won't live to see the day that cats act more like dogs. Wolves began to adapt to human society while humans were still nomadic. So while humans were still walking around following the hunt. At least 14,000 years ago, there's some evidence points to more than that, where it was most pointed toward Middle East, Eurasia, Northern Africa, although it's not entirely clear. And there may have been two separate domestication processes going on simultaneously in different parts of the world. So you can tell that we don't actually know that much about domestication of the dog. So there are two theories that are good to know about why and how the dog became domesticated from the wolf. The human intervention theory is that humans adopted wolf pups, and let's just focus on that for a second. Do humans adopt wolf pups? That's what cracks me up. So humans stole wolf pups from the dens, <laughs> that makes me laugh, and natural selection favored those less aggressive and better at begging for food. So over time, if one of these wolf pups would have been aggressive toward the handler, I would assume that they probably would have killed it back in those days. And I'm talking thousands of years ago. So they probably would have killed it, it wouldn't have had the opportunity to reproduce, so therefore those that were less aggressive and more of a companion to humans would be provided the opportunity to reproduce and then of course they would pass on their genes to the next generation. Canine intervention theory is where dogs essentially de domesticated themselves by adapting to a new niche, which is human refuse dumps. So what that means is that essentially the dogs would follow, or the wolves at that point, would follow humans around, cleaning up after them. Scavenging cannons were less likely to flee from people, and therefore they survived. So as they get closer to humans because they have a need to eat, and they're following them and chasing after the humans to f to eat what they've left over, they naturally become friendlier. It's kind of like our coyote population today. Coyotes don't have a lot of fear of humans, and they're an urban animal, and it does cause problems for urban communities. But those dogs, if you can imagine it being the wolves back in the days where domestication was starting, if they're comfortable with people and not running away, it's more likely that those people can then take them in and start treating them as owned domesticated animals. Initially in the domestication process, all that was selected for was that one trait, the ability to eat in proximity to people. So essentially, if an animal, i.e. the wolf back then, but the, 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 through domestication, if that animal had a trait that allowed them to eat in proximity to humans, then they would become a beneficial animal to be bred again for the humans and for the, the successor dogs. Canis lupus familiaris. What a beautiful dog that is. So then we have talk about the wolf dog of today. So a dog and a wolf hybrid, a dog-wolf mix. Genetically, the wolf and the dog are the same species. Currently, there are no genetic tests available to distinguish a wolf from a dog. And this always comes up, especially in northern communities, and it does make sense in northern communities where you actually have active wolf populations coming into town, being around in, in heat female dogs, or likewise with the male dogs roaming, then it, it definitely can happen. So you hear it, the more, the more I visit up north, I tend to hear wolf dog, wolf dog cross, first generation, second generation, third generation, whatever it might be. 
But then you also hear about it in the cities, and it'll be like a really interesting, unlikely story. Like, yeah, this guy was breeding wolves with his German shepherd, and that's what, that's the dog that I've got. But then the dog's only like 50 pounds. So sometimes it's a really great story that people tell, but sometimes, you know, realistically, definitely there are wolf dogs out there. So there's no test that tells specifically if it's a dog or if it's a wolf, and no definitive test to detect the amount of wolf content in dogs. And then overall, many northern breeds of dogs carry many or all of the same physical attributes as the wolf dog. And that's mainly because of the location and the, the nature of what they have to do day to day in the outside world. So the again, we're looking at a wolf, thick coat, paws for snow. They've got the abilities to meet the environmental hazards. And then, of course, that trait, those traits are going to be passed along. Now this was an interesting video that went around. I hated this video so much. So this is up, I don't know if this was Northern Ontario or Nunavut or Northern Quebec or anyways, it could be, I thought I thought it was Nunavut, but I could be wrong. So this was a, a likely a sled dog who's chained up. They're often, they're, they're all chained up out there and that's totally fine. That's their normal lifestyle. And then, of course, this giant predator polar bear comes up. And somebody starts filming saying, look how cute this is. The polar bear is playing with the dog and la, la, la. And it's super cute. And then if you actually watch the video through, it makes me crazy because that is not a comfortable dog. That is not a comfortable dog. That's a top predator coming in to see this dog and to essentially suss out the dog. So sure, maybe the top predator was trying to play. It, there is potential, could have been a juvenile, definitely could happen, but the dog is not enjoying it when you watch the video again. That dog is showing definite uh, indicators of fear, which is scary. It's totally scary. He's chained up, and he's got a polar bear up all up in his grill. So reclassification, scientists are encountering difficulties when trying to differentiate between wolves and dogs. They're so closely related that the dog has been reclassified from Canis familiaris, as, and it's been reclassified into a subspecies of wolf in 1993. Great. In summary, for the class that I'm teaching, we've got review questions posted online, and then I also highly recommend this eyewitness dog video, and of course I have review questions for it, as a lot of people do, but it's a really great video to watch about the evolution of the dog.